Excel skills are critical in college, in graduate school, and in the corporate world. In this lesson, we're going to review some Excel fundamentals plus features that will be especially useful in finance. We're starting with the assumption that students have a basic knowledge of Excel, how to open it, what a worksheet is, what a cell is. Building on that, we're going to look through the topics on this slide. If you do not feel your Excel skills are at a level where a brief review of specific finance-related features will be meaningful, I suggest you access some beginner tutorials before proceeding. Depending on which version of Excel you're using, 2010, 13, or 2011 on a Mac, the links on this slide are posted separately, and they offer a wide variety of video tutorials from beginner level to advanced. In addition to the topics covered in this lesson, I strongly suggest you invest a bit over 30 minutes to watch the Microsoft tutorials shown on this slide and also posted separately. These are well done and well worth your time. So let's get started on our review. Since Excel is designed basically to handle numeric data, how to enter that data is pretty fundamental. Entering a numeric value in a cell can be accomplished in several ways. To enter a positive value of 450 in a cell, you can start with an equal sign, a plus sign, or just start with a number, 450. To enter a negative value, you begin with a minus sign, followed by the numeric value, or begin with equals and minus, and the value. To enter a dollar value, begin with a dollar sign. To enter a percentage, either begin or end with a percent sign to display 10%. As noted, if you enter equal 10%, Excel will display the percentage as a decimal, 0.1. Basic math in Excel uses five symbols. The plus to add, the minus to subtract, the asterisk to multiply, the right slash to divide, and the caret to raise to a power. So using the given data, to add A1 and A2, you would enter equal A1 plus A2. To subtract A1 from A2, you would enter equal A2 minus A1. To multiply A4 by 5, you would enter equal A4 asterisk 5. To divide A2 by A3, you would enter equal A2 slash A3. To square A3, you would enter equal A3 caret 2. There are two ways to add a column of values in Excel. The first and the longest way is to use the plus sign and point to each of the cells in the column. In the cell where you want the total, begin with the equal sign. Point to the first cell in the list, its border will flash, press the plus sign and point to the next cell in the column and repeat down the column. Finish by pressing enter. The shorter approach is to use Excel's built-in summation function, designated on the toolbar with a sigma. In the cell where you want the total, click on the sigma. If there's a column or row of values directly adjacent to that cell, Excel will default to that range. You can change the range by highlighting the range you want totaled and press Enter. Excel contains a wide variety of built-in functions besides the summation function. You can click on the FX on the formula bar or click on formulas on the toolbar. Either approach will show categories of the functions available. For our purposes, the financial and statistical functions will be the most used. Functions are also available for date and time, math and trig, database, and a variety of others. When a function is selected, a description is displayed with the data entry window. Let's look at one of the statistical functions as an example. In general, all the functions work in pretty much the same way. In this example, we have a column of numbers and we want to find the average. In the cell where you want the average displayed, click on FX or formulas. Select statistical and average. Like the summation function, if there's a column or row of values directly adjacent to the result cell, Excel will default to that range. You can change the range by highlighting a different set of numbers. Press enter and the average will be displayed. We're going to cover order of operations more thoroughly in the algebra and statistics lesson, but let's look at it here relative to Excel. This video covers in more depth order of operations in Excel, and it's also posted individually with this lesson. We've covered order of operations in a separate tutorial. In this one, I want to look specifically at entering equations and order of operations in Excel. So first, let's review that order. Parentheses first. Deal with what's inside the parens first. Then handle any exponents. Then multiply, divide. Finally, add and subtract. That's the hierarchy especially in Excel. If you want to be certain of a specific order, use parentheses to force it.
First example I want to look at. Very simple, linear equation. Y is equal to A plus BX. Given A, B, and X, we can find Y in several ways. As it turns out, this first one, A plus B times X, is OK. Excel uses the order of operations, too, and it will multiply first, so that's OK. If you want to be sure, feel confident about it, use the parens. That's definite. Do not, do not use absolute numbers when entering data in a function or an equation. Point to the cells. Make use of the power of Excel, so if the variable changes, your results change. Okay, let's look at a little bit more involved example. Y is equal to A plus B plus C quantity squared minus X cubed. You can enter this in one cell, being very careful to use parens to define your order. Note that parens are required for the second component, the quantity squared. Alternately, when you have a very complicated equation with several components, it can be wise to break it into parts, calculate each separately, and then combine them. In this example, I've made three components, even though component one is just A. Component two is the B plus C quantity squared. Component three is the X cubed. With these three calculated separately, combining them is easy and much less error prone. We're going to be presented with several formulas in this course with three, four, five, even more components. It's very easy to make a mistake trying to solve the whole formula in one cell. Breaking it into parts, solving each separately, and then combining the results is far safer. You need to get in the habit of using the cell references. We've already looked at multiplying two values. In this example, we want to multiply the values in column A times the percentage in column B and place the results in column C. Start with the cursor in C1, enter equals, point to A1, asterisk, point to B1, and press enter. 45 will display in C1. Place the cursor on C1, right click and select copy. Highlight C2 and C3 and press enter. The formula from C1 will be copied to C2 and C3. The formula entered in C1 is equal to A1 asterisk B1, and it's interpreted as multiply the value in the cell 2 to the left of where I am, I'm in C1, times the value in the cell 1 to the left. When the formula is copied down column C, the formula is modified relative to the destination cell, so C2 will read a2 times B2, etc. As you just saw in the previous example, when a formula is copied, the cell references in it are adjusted based on the destination cell. In our C1 formula, if our C1 formula were copied to F1, it would read D1 times E1. This is powerful and extremely useful, but sometimes you want to copy formulas and you don't want all or some of the cell references to change. In this slightly different example, we want to take 10% of each of the values in column A. We could enter the formulas one by one in column C, but there's an easier way. We can freeze the reference to the 10% in B1 and let the reference to A1 change with the destination location. To do this, use the F4 key. When entering the formula in C1, enter A1 asterisk B1 and press F4. B1 will change to $B$1, which freezes the reference to column B and row 1. F4 is a toggle key. Both row and column frozen, $B$1. Row frozen, column not, B$1. Column frozen, row not, $B$1. Neither frozen, B1. There are occasions where what's placed in the cell may depend on another value or a function. The if statement can handle this. The basic form is if, then, else. If A is true, then B, else C. In this simple example, cell A1 contains the value 450. In B1, the if statement reads equal if, left paren, A1 is equal to 450, comma 1, comma 0, close parens. So if A1 is equal to 450 is true, then B1 will be a 1, otherwise it will be a 0. Most of the topics in this lesson are covered again in this video with examples showing actual Excel on the screen. It's about five and a half minutes long and it's posted with this lesson. In this video, I want to go over some basics in Excel. This will be a refresher for some, but I want to be sure we're all familiar with some of the basic features of Excel. This will be a pretty brief tutorial, just hitting some high points. So that said, let's quickly review some Excel basics. 
first, pretty basic, entering numbers. A number can be entered in a cell in a variety of ways. I can start with equal, 450, and hit enter. I can begin with a plus, enter. I can begin with a minus, or I can just start with a number. If I want the value to be dollars, begin with a dollar sign. If I want it to be a percentage, end with a percent sign. Now let's look at adding and subtracting numbers and summing columns of numbers. An important note, always reference cells. Do not enter absolute numbers in functions or formulas. The power of Excel is in its what-if capability. To add the 450 in cell C9 and the 625 in C10 and put the sum in D10. Place your cursor in D10. Start with equal C9 plus C10. Press enter. If I change the value in C10, the sum immediately changes to reflect that. If you had entered the absolute numbers 450 plus 625, it would not change. Subtraction works basically the same way. Begin with an equals C12 minus C11. To sum the column of numbers, two ways to do it. Easiest way is to use Excel's built-in summation formula. It's the sigma right up here. The range will default to those five numbers directly above the cell I'm in because that's what Excel thinks I want. If it's not, you can highlight what you do want. Press enter. Alternately, we could add them just like we did before. C9 plus C10 plus C11 plus C12 plus C13. Either way works. That just is a bit more cumbersome. Let's look at copying cells and relative addressing. Excel makes it very easy to enter a formula in a cell and then copy it to other cells. When you copy a formula, Excel changes the cell references relative to where the formula is placed. So let's look at this example. I want to multiply the percentages in column B times the numbers in column C and place the results in column D. In the first one, equals B19 times C19. Now I can copy that down two ways. Place the cursor on D19, right click, select copy. That'll start flashing. Highlight down where I want it to go and press enter. Alternately, place your cursor on D19. Move over to the bottom right hand corner. See the little plus sign? Just drag it down. Now look at what Excel has copied. This cell reads B19 times C19. This one reads B20 times C20. Excel has changed the formula relative to where it's placed. When we entered that formula in D19, Excel actually interpreted that as multiply the value in the cell 2 to the left of where I am times the value in the cell 1 to the left of where I am. So wherever you copy it, that's how it's going to interpret it. Being able to enter a formula in a cell and copy it to other cells and have it adjusted for its new location is very powerful, but that's not always what you want. In this example, I want to take 10% of each of those numbers. We could enter the formula in each cell individually, but there's a better way. In the first cell up there, D25 equal, place your cursor on the 10%, B25, and press the F4 key. See the dollar signs that come around it? That freezes the reference to both column B and row 25. Wherever you copy that reference, it's going to say B25. Press F4 again. The 25 is frozen, but not the B. B and not the 25, neither both. That's what we want, times C25. Now, I can copy this down just like I did before. Notice what's in there. B25 times C26, B25 times C27. This can be very useful in a variety of calculations that we're going to come across. Now, you may have been introduced to a few Excel functions, but we're going to be using quite a few in this course, especially the financial functions and some statistical ones. So I want to give a quick intro to how to access and use a function. In this example, I'm going to use the average function to get the average of those three numbers. So I place my cursor on D39. Hit the FX key right up here. Notice the choice. I've got financials, date and time, math and trig, statistical, etc. Average is a statistical function. Pick average. I have a window. Notice it's defaulted to that range right there. Again, I could highlight a different range if that isn't what I wanted. Press enter and there's my average. 
The last topic I want to look at is the if-then function. If any of you have done any programming, you're familiar with the basic if-then decision statement. Excel has a logical if-then function, which can be very useful. It basically takes the form of if A is true, then B else C. And in this simple example, if cell C46 is equal to 450, I want to put a 1 in C47, otherwise 0. Equals if that. This has been a very quick review of some of the features of Excel that, are, that will be very useful in this course. This ends our brief review of Excel methods needed in finance. The tutorial videos, as I said, are posted separately for viewing outside the lesson. And again, I strongly recommend that you look at those Microsoft tutorials. They're well worth your time.